Children, you are released to Children's Church. Hope you're all doing well. I hope it's going to warm up finally, right? Maybe. The rain's nice, though. Someone told me it looks like the west side of the state on the east side for the first time in a long, long time. So that's kind of interesting to see all the green. We're going to keep going with our basic series. If you're visiting with us and you'd like to let us know you're visiting with us, well, first of all, we probably know you're visiting with us. And, uh, but we do have little, in the pew back, little visitor card and an opportunity to just give your name and email, and that way I can get in touch with you and encourage you. If you want to know more about our church, then there's a little trifold that has a Spokane Bible Church on the front of it. It's right out here about where the bulletins are. It just tells the history of our church, the vision, and a narrative doctrinal statement, and when we meet, and how you can find us out on the World Wide Web. So all that is available, and uh, I hope you will sign up for the potluck next Sunday and also encourage our graduates and get to spend some time with Jim and Phyllis Myers, who will be with us. So it should be a really enjoyable time, and I hope if you're able, you can also join us for the uh, workday on Saturday, uh, those of you who will uh, be interested in working in digging ditches and you know, laying down the line and you know, for sprinkler systems and all that type of thing. Okay, let's uh, have an opportunity before we get started in our study to uh, get in fellowship with the Lord, right? 1 John 1.9, 1 John's a book written to believers, encouraging them to be in fellowship and to abide. And so um, the promise in 1 John 1.9 is that uh, believers need to confess whenever they have known sin so that they can get restored to fellowship. So if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the believer should walk in fellowship with the Lord, and uh, it's a close walk, it's an intimate walk, uh, but sin can block that. So we confess that, and then we're back in fellowship. So let's, let's pray and have an opportunity for that privately. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the so great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that in him we are ultimately rich, for all the riches of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus Christ. Help us to build up a fortress of understanding of your word and how to live that word faithfully in our lives so that we can stand against the schemes of wickedness in this world, so that we can see deceit, we can see temptation, and not be allured by those things, uh, but understand righteousness and truth and how to acquire this and also how to live this. We ask that you'd open our eyes today to see wonderful things about the kingdom program for history, since it's a grand topic and the goal of history is to establish your kingdom. And so we look forward to understanding why we are in this world. Why are we here? What is our purpose in life? What are you doing in our lives? And why are you doing it? And uh, give us answers to these big questions that every human has. And uh, may we understand the words of Scripture aright. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, there was a couple questions last week. Remember, you can always ask questions. It doesn't mean I'll be able to answer them, but you can always ask a question, just write it down, put it in one of those little boxes on the wall there, and um, that's also where you'd put a visitor card, those two little boxes there, and, or if you leave it on a pew, I'm sure somebody will find it. But um, a couple of questions, so let's deal with these quickly, because I don't want to, we've talked about some of this in past classes, but people come and go, so you never know. The first question was, when God created earth, was it like Pangaea, or was it divided into continents, you know, like it is today? Well, uh, simply, the, the simple answer is, uh, no, it was not like it is today, divided into continents. The way that at Genesis 1, 9, and 10 read is the way God originally created the earth was basically like one single supercontinent. Um, but it's not in the way that Pangaea uh, is described. If you read the, the theory of Pangaea, it's one of many cycles of plate tectonics and continental divide where the earth, you know, crashed together, you know, continents drifted together, crashed together, and then moved apart. So it's not exactly like the Pangaea theory. In fact, if you take, you know, what we all probably saw in school, 
and that's the Pangaea picture. You've got Africa and South America, and North America, Europe, and all this stuff. Uh, they really don't actually fit together. There's like 30% of the Earth's uh, surface missing. Uh, so um, if you fill in all the gaps in the picture, yeah, you won't see that 30% is missing, but 30% is kind of a big chunk since it's like a third. <laughs> so, um, so it actually doesn't really fit together. The way that creationists to, um, describe the early Earth and then the post-flood Earth or let's just say the created earth and the post-flood earth, is they talk about the world of Rodinia. That's what they call it. And Rodinia is basically a supercontinent, as Genesis 1, 9, and 10 describes. Most of the earth was land with less water surface than we have today. And probably the elevation of the highest mountains were no more than about 8,000 feet. And so this was Rodinia, and then at the flood you have a catastrophic event which causes massive amounts of erosion of land, soils, and these have basically piled on top of the current continents, and we know that as sedimentary rock. That's where you go find uh, fossils because it was all buried quickly, you know, and uh, underwater and so forth. And forming uh, conditions for fossilization. So at any rate, um, then what creationists describe is a Pangaea forming when continents by rapid movement actually hit one another, you know, collided and formed like mountain ranges and so forth. In fact, well, that's one of the questions in geology that's uh, secular geology that's never, they can't answer really is how you form mountains. Uh, creationists argue that they form very rapidly by high power events collision of continents, whereas everything's moving very slowly in secular geology, and you don't have the force or the power to uh, describe mountain building. So while they do try to describe it by plate tectonics and so forth, there's not the energy uh, sufficient to create mountain ranges and stuff like the Appalachians or the Cascades or the Rockies or whatever. So um, all these things, though, are described, and you can research these things, uh, what creationists have done. So I would just say there's a Rodinia-type Earth originally, and then after the flood, it's a Pangaea type event which forms the mountains, and then um, uh, further catastrophes in the lap, latter part of the flood that resulted in the current basic configuration of the continents. Okay, um, second question: Why did the serpent sin if if God made him? Okay, question: Why did Adam sin if God made him? You know, it's the same basic question, right? Um, well, look, there's only three ways that we know as humans that were possible creations. The first possible creation is a world where all the creatures are non-sentient beings. That is, they're just determined, like robots or automatons. Uh, this is a possibility, but in that, in that possible world, every being or creature would only do what that being or creature was basically programmed to do, and it could not do other. So in that world, there's no choice, uh, there's no love that's genuine. Everything is just determined. Everyone does what they have to do. So that's one possible world, right? Another possible, possible world is a world in which we're not created. And if that were the world, then uh, we are not responsible because there's no one to whom we ultimately are responsible to. There's no God. So that's another worldview, an idea uh, that could be a possibility. Uh, the third possible world is a world where all creatures, creatures that are cognizant, self-conscious and self-directing, uh, are sentient beings. That is, we're responsible beings. And in this world, there is real choice, and there is real love, and there is real sin, and uh, these actions are significant, and they are meaningful because they are actually real. And God chose to create this third type of world a world where there are creatures who are sentient, they're responsible, they have self-consciousness, they're self-directing, they can make choices for or against God, and in that context, they can choose to love God or they can choose to rebel against God and sin. And the same thing is true, of course, for angelic beings. They could choose to sin or to love God. And that's the type of world God created. Um, so the way that God made us, he made us incorrupt as well as angels he made them incorrupt but corruptible that is with the capacity to become corrupt uh, by choosing uh, to sin against him okay 
So um, beyond that, I can't really answer the question other than to say that this is the universe that God decided to create, the way he decided to make things. Okay, today we're going to look at this issue called the kingdom. I consider this a basic uh, thing about the Bible. The other things that will be basic that follow will be covenants and dispensations, and then we'll try to overlay all these things so you see the whole, what we might call a basic is the plan of God, okay, the plan of God. So, uh, but it's going to be these three elements together. So the way that we've done this so far is, I think, to show in logical order the way that things interrelate in God's plan. I can't believe this pencil's dead again. My Apple pencil's dead. But it's simple to follow, right? We talk about who God is, right? That's the very first thing we did. Who is God? What is he like? And then we talked about man, and what man is like, because man is made in God's image. So first we know who God is, then we know the image of God. Remember, image and likeness is like shadow and reflection. We are the shadow and reflection of God. So we studied God first, then man made in the image of God, and then we talked about sin, right? Because that's man's basic problem. It's the basic problem in the world and the suffering that comes along with it. And then we talked about God's solution to the problem, which is the seed, and that's what we sketched last week, which is the seed, the story of the two seeds down through Scripture described in Genesis 3.15. So we know who God is, basically. We know who we are, made in God's image. We know our problem is basically sin and that the solution is basically the seed story. Now we have to back up into Genesis and go ask ourselves, what is the goal of history? Like, where is everything headed? That way we can understand what is the purpose for my life? Why am I here in this world? And what is God doing? What is he trying to accomplish in my life? Okay? So these are obviously very important questions. And so there's a big answer that comes in the scripture. So let's look at that uh, story. It's the story, basically, of the kingdom. This is going to link in very closely with us being made in the image of God. So let's look at Genesis 1.27. And you'll notice that kingdom purpose or goal for history is tied with man being made in the image of God, which links back to God because that's whose image we're made in. So all these things relate. But Genesis 1.27, well, verse 26 then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them do what? Rule. Okay, that is a word that is related to kings, queens, kingdoms. Okay, um, that is the purpose for man being made in the image of God in order to rule. Repeated in verse 28. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish. Now, we do see man exercising this rule uh, in chapter 2. Notice chapter 2, verse 15. Here's a ruling function. One of the functions of ruling is having dominion, developing things. Uh, verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. So, the cultivation and keeping or maintaining of a garden is a ruling function. Uh, also look at verse 19, where we see man exercising his ruling function. Out of the ground, God, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. Okay, naming, like categorization, what we call taxonomy, right? classifying things, is a ruling function. And God gave Adam this first task. Uh, it was a ruling task. It's a kingly type function. And so we see man beginning his ruling function in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. This is his purpose. It's to rule over the earth basically as a responsible uh, steward. At this time, men, we would say at this time, are above angels. We were created in a position, in a hierarchy of beings, and the hierarchy or the place we hold was above angels. But it's not going to remain that way, so we pointed out uh, now things are going to change. 
We already studied the fall and the sin in chapter 3. And we said that even though man fell and sinned, he's still made in the image of God, right? It's just that the image of God is now damaged or marred. We also found out that when man fell in Genesis 3, that the kingdom was transferred to Satan, who now uh, controls the kingdoms of this world. So let's look uh, at the New Testament. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 31, to see that Satan is now the god of this world. He's the ruler of this, this age. It wasn't originally that way. Of course, it was given to Adam and to Eve, and they had ruling function, uh, but something happened. So let's see the description of the change of the tide here in chapter 12, verse 31. The Lord says, uh, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So who is the present ruler of this world at the time of Christ who will be cast out? Well, that's, it's Satan. Okay, We can go back to Luke chapter 4 to confirm that, in fact, it is Satan. Luke chapter 4 and the temptations of Christ after his 40 days uh, fasting and so forth. Luke 4, verses 5 and 6, one of the temptations that had to do with the lust of the eyes. It says, And Satan led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Well, actually the Holy Spirit did, excuse me. In verse 6, The devil said to him in that situation, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. If you bow down and worship me, it shall all be yours. So Satan is the one to whom all the kingdoms of the world have been given. You ask, uh, who, who gave it to him? Well, Adam in the garden. Because it was first given to Adam, he was to be a responsible steward and to rule God's kingdom on earth, on God's behalf. But he handed over to Satan at the fall. And so now we have... Satan, who is the ruler of the kingdoms of this world, as John 12, 31 said, eventually he will be cast out. But he is currently in a position of rule over the kingdoms of this world. Now, um, at this point then in bullet point two, angels now are above men since the fall. Um, because they're ruling over, at least fallen angels, are ruling over uh, sinful man. The seed conflict that we studied last week is God's plan to reverse this whole situation and restore man to his rightful place above angels okay, and to rule in the kingdom. So that lays out for you in a nutshell what history is all about. Now that there's a fall, God wants to re basically reverse the fall and restore man to a position of rule. Um, currently, though, fallen men are building kingdoms under Satan's rule. So turn to Genesis 10 to see one of these kingdoms probably the, most, the one you're most familiar with, you'll see here, but there were other, um, you can see the expansion of this kingdom, kingdom of man, that's being built under the auspices of Satan's rule. In Genesis 10, 10, it's talking of uh, verse 9, Nimrod, don't ever name your kid Nimrod, okay, uh, Nimrod, a mighty hunter, technically against the Lord, someone who was a rebel, essentially. Verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom, see, not God's kingdom, but it's a human kingdom, man's kingdom, was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalneh in the land of Shiner, Shiner. From that land he went forth into Assyria, and he built Nineveh and Rehoboth, Ir and Kalah, and resin between Nineveh and Kalah, that is the great city. Okay, so it's describing this, this kingdom centered mainly in what we know as Babel, which developed into Babylon, but extending out, it's an expanding human kingdom under the auspices of Satan's rule, okay, through them. Now, God wants to reverse this whole situation, uh, so what he's going to do is he's going to establish what we call a theocratic kingdom, okay? By theocratic, we mean that God himself is the ruler, okay? And he's going to establish this in this world, either within, it will be within Satan's kingdom, as it develops through these other nations, 
or and also against these other kingdoms. Okay, so look in Exodus 19 to see the development of this kingdom idea. There's a particular people we know as Israel, born out of Egypt, right? That God is going to um, build into a kingdom in the land, a promised land called Israel, and so forth. And we'll discuss that next week with the covenants. But look in Exodus 19, verse 4. As they come to Mount Sinai, the foot of Mount Sinai, the Lord says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, uh, meaning the Mosaic covenant, which he's about to give as he gives the Ten Commandments, uh, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses was to tell them, that look, okay, I'm giving you this law, you're to obey this law and keep this law. And if you do, you're going to be my own special treasure or possession among all the peoples on earth, uh, all because all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests, and you shall be a holy nation. So that was one of the purposes of the law, is that Israel would keep the law and become this, okay, um, this kingdom of priests. A priest goes between, right? He goes between... Uh, people and the Lord. He mediates between nations, in this case, and God. And so the nation Israel, these would serve as a kingdom of priests for all other nations to come to God. Okay? So this is the beginning of, let's say, God's kingdom. It's a theocratic kingdom because God himself is the king. This is not the beginning of the monarchy with Saul or David. This is four centuries before all of that. So God himself is the king during this period. Um, now, by the way, I'm not talking about the universal kingdom of God. Okay, that's, that's just a given. I'm only talking about God's kingdom as it relates to the earth in this, in this lesson. Uh, God's universal kingdom just means he's sovereign over the whole universe. Uh, we know that. So we're talking about God's kingdom as it relates to earth and its presence or absence on earth and what he's trying to do with the earth and with man on the earth. Okay, so um, during this time when God was king, okay, theocratic kingdom, beginning basically in Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai, okay, and will extend all the way until the first human king, which is Saul. Okay, so for about four centuries, you'll have a theocratic kingdom. During this time, bullet point two, you have servants of Yahweh. That's what they're called. Okay, Moses is called a servant of Yahweh. Joshua is also called a servant of Yahweh. Okay, they weren't kings, but they did you know, rule to some extent on God's behalf over the various tribes of Israel. And then you have the judges, what I sometimes call warlords, if you were with us on Wednesday nights. Um, they were 12 men mentioned in the book of Judges. And in that, but in that period of history, Israel's history, it says God uh, was not recognized as king. So that whole section of Israel's history is a very painful one as they depart from God, they forsake God, and they worship idols to the extent that they did not recognize God as king, even though he was king. Okay, so that's the theocratic kingdom. It's God's kingdom where God is king, over one specific nation amongst Satan's kingdoms as they are, you know, among the Moabites, the Ammonites, other people uh, who were developing human kingdoms under Satan's rule. So this is God's kingdom in the midst, let's say, of Satan's kingdom, okay? God wants to develop a kingdom, uh, let's say a counter kingdom, okay? Now, the next kingdom comes is what we know as the mediatorial kingdom. Um, mediate, you know, from to mediate. So that's where what you're going to have in a mediatorial kingdom is God is going to still rule, but he's going to do so through a human king. Whereas before he just ruled directly, now he's going to rule through a human king. And you'll think of people like Saul and David and Solomon and so forth, okay? And that would be proper. So um, the people at the end of the judges period, they're very frustrated with life. 
everyone was just doing whatever they wanted to do all the time. It was a very licentious and crazy, confused society. And the people asked for a king like all the other nations. In fact, in Deuteronomy 17, 11, back in the time of Moses, it said they would ask for a king like all the other nations. And sure enough, um, four centuries later, they did ask for a king like all the other nations. And God actually gave them a king like all the other nations. He gave them uh, Saul. So let's turn to 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel 9 to see this first king. It wasn't exactly the kind of king that God wanted to give them, but this is what they asked for, and so he gave it to them. Be careful what you ask for. Okay? Uh, you might get it, and it will not be good. So let's read about this first king. Of Israel, 1 Samuel 9, 15. Now, a day before Saul's coming, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel, Samuel's the prophet and a, and a judge, uh, saying, About this time tomorrow I'll send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have regarded my people, because their cry has come up to me. You know, we want a king. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, Behold, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall rule over my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. A seer is a prophet. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And in the morning I will let you go, and I will let you, or, or tell you all that is on your mind. Uh, now, there's a back story here going on in verse 20. Saul was looking for his donkeys, and that's kind of a funny story because he's all concerned about the donkeys, but... Probably more concerned about donkeys than being king. Uh, As for your donkeys, which were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's household? And Saul replied, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak me to me in this way? And he goes on, of course, and tells him that he's to be uh, king. Okay. Chapter 10, um, let's just find the verse in chapter 10 where he is presented as king. Verse 19, 1 Samuel 10, 19. But you have today rejected your God who delivers you from all your calamities. Remember, he was a theocratic king. God was their deliverer. And your distresses, and yet you've said no, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, okay, so they wanted a king, <laughs> and they wanted one specifically like uh, all the other nations. And notice verse 23, here he is. So they ran and took him from there. He's hiding. He was hiding in some baggage. He's like at the baggage claim in an airport hiding. And this is the king. Okay. So they ran and took him from there, and then he stood among the people. He was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. Okay, so he's a head, that means he's a head taller than he's, he's Shaquille O'Neal, okay? And uh, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? Surely there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people, I mean, they can see him. I mean, this guy, look at the guy, he's a monster. He's going to be a great king, right? So they all say, long live the king. Well, uh, he was a king, but he was a king like all the other kingdoms. Let me ask you a question. Who was ruling the other kingdoms around Israel? Satan. There were Satan kingdoms being developed through human nations. So what kind of king did they just get? One just like that. Okay? So that is a little bit scary to realize that as you read through Scripture. So is it any surprise when you come to chapter 15, verse 23? Saul has just blown it, okay? He's just rebelled against the Lord. The Lord told him to do X. He decided he was going to do Y. Okay. So that never turns out well. Verse 23, uh, Samuel is saying, For rebellion is as the sin of divination. That's why I say, like, uh, rebellion is as bad as sorcery. You say, well, I'm not a witch. I don't do Ouija boards. I don't, you know, call up the dead. Well, yeah, but do you rebel? Well, yeah, I've rebelled against the Lord. Well, then that's just as bad as being a sorcerer, so get over yourself. And insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. 
insubordination. Have you ever been insubordinate? I mean, we all have to the Lord. We're like, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm not doing it your way. Well, that's as bad as idolatry. You say, well, I don't, I don't worship little things and set them up. Well, you did something just as bad, so get over yourself. He says to Saul, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, guess what? He has also rejected you from being king. So God rejected Saul. Now, he's going to choose another guy in chapter 16, a replacement, and he's not a king like all the other nations. He's a different type of king. And who is this gentleman? David. By the way, he had to be a man before he can be a gentleman. Uh, that's, I learned that from... Uh, who's who's uh, the... John Wayne, thank you. You can learn something from John Wayne. Okay? Uh, you have to be a man before you can be a gentleman. Picture him saying that. It's really good. Um, okay, so David is going to be chosen. Remember, he's just a shepherd boy. Okay, he grows up around Bethlehem. He takes care of his sheep. He's the youngest of all of his father Jesse's sons. And um, God chooses David and anoints him, even though Saul was still on the throne. So this story goes on. Saul tries to kill him many, many times, right? But let's turn over to 2 Samuel 7. By this time, uh, Saul has already died. David has taken the throne, and he has consolidated the 12 uh, tribes under his rule. It's at this time that God makes a covenant with him, and we'll look a little bit more at covenants next week. But here's the covenant to establish what? but a kingdom, okay? Remember, the original purpose in Genesis is God wanted man to rule a kingdom, so this is highly related to everything we've already seen in Genesis 1. So, 1 Samuel 7, verse 12. When your days are complete, David, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, which would be a temple, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. So this is a mediatorial kingdom. See, God ruling through the human Davidic dynasty. Okay, and it goes, it goes on. Okay? Um, verse 16, Your house and your kingdom, that's David's house, and David's kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Three eternal things there. David's house or dynasty, David's kingdom, and David's throne. Okay? These are eternally covenanted by God. And so you can see that God is strategizing with the Davidic covenant here to restore the kingdom that God originally gave to man in Genesis, but which was lost to Satan. Okay, you see everything that's happening. In other words, I know that our lives are like blades of grass, right? In a forest that covers the whole earth. And we get used to looking at all the other blades of grass around us. And it's a very small outlook. I mean, we have to do what? We have to basically go to the moon and look at the earth and see that there's a much bigger thing going on. And that's what God is doing here in working in the nation Israel and specifically in the house of David to bring about the king who will complete what Adam failed to do in the garden. Okay? Somehow you and I are going to get involved in this mix. Okay? So what I'm trying to do is tell you why you're in this world. Okay? Like why are you actually here? And what are you supposed to be doing? Okay? I'm trying to get away from the earth and look at it from the, you know, God's point of view, let's just say from the moon, so you can see how you fit in, okay? Because you're very important. You're a very important piece, okay? Now, so God chooses David, eternal kingdom, eternal throne, eternal dynasty. And this comes down through Solomon. Solomon builds the temple and so forth, so these prophecies are, have been fulfilled or are in the process of being fulfilled. Um, but the kingdom divides. We know that. It, it, they have trouble. It divides. You have a northern kingdom of Israel, a southern kingdom of Israel, and because they rebel against the Lord, just like Saul did, unfortunately. And eventually, by the time you get to the end of First Kings, I'm sorry, Second Kings, Second Kings 25, the last chapter, you see the southern kingdom, Judah, which was ruled by David's house, you see them going to exile to Babylon. Okay? So, at that point in history, when the Babylonians defeated Judah, 
and the house of David in 587 BC, this is, this is an important moment in history because the kingdom of God, as we have seen it from Mount Sinai, is no longer on earth. It is no longer a visible kingdom on earth. Now all you have again is, you know, this is Satan's kingdom, Satan's world. There's no kingdom of God within the midst of it as a counter kingdom, okay? So, how do we know that? Well, the Shekinah glory left the temple. That was a visible symbol of God's presence on earth. It didn't exist anymore. It left in the book of Ezekiel. Um, and the book of Daniel, okay? Daniel talks about how political supremacy was being transferred to Gentile kingdoms. Um, political supremacy transferred to Gentiles. Now, here's an interesting thing. We want to look at this, okay? The prophets, all the prophets, in fact. We'll just look at a few. All the prophets predicted that the kingdom would be restored. So if it's going to be restored, wouldn't it have to be essentially the same as it was before? Otherwise, it wouldn't be a restoration. It'd just be a total new, different thing. Um, but it's going to be a restoration of that kingdom that was in existence in the times of, you know, David and Solomon and so forth. Okay, so let's look at a few of those prophecies. Um, how about Obadiah? Can, can, can we find Obadiah? It's one page. <laughs> That's what makes it tough to find. Um, the Jews just had these as the 12, right? And uh, so it's one scroll. And, you, you know, they didn't have chapter and verse divisions, so good luck. But, you know, they really had to know the Bible because they'd be, like, if they had to find a place in the Bible, they'd open up the scroll, they'd roll the scroll out and find the place. In other words, they knew if they just read, oh, no, it's after this, I'm reading this part, no, it's still after this. They could know by reading. <laughs> they really knew their Bible. Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is an early prophet. If, if I can find it, Hosea, then we've got Joel, and then Obadiah. Right? No Amos, and then Obadiah. There it is. What? Right after yeah, right after Amos. Thank you. And before Jonah. Okay. So, Obadiah 15 through 21. This is a prophecy of the restoration of uh, the kingdom. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Now, the, the other nations, the kingdoms of the world, are not going to last, right? Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, which would be Jerusalem, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape, okay, a Jewish remnant. It will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau will be stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them, so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev, which is the southern portion of Israel, will possess the mountains of Esau. Those of the Shephelah, which is the coastal plain, uh, they will possess the Philistine plain. Also possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. Do you see that the kingdom of God is being restored in the land of Israel? And the exiles of the hosts of the son of, uh, sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites and so forth. Um, it goes on. Notice verse 21. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau and the kingdom will be who? It will be the Lord's. In other words, there's the restoration of the kingdom from ancient days that will come in future days. Amos 9. So back to the left. Amos 9. Just one page back. Amos 9, 11 through 15. Most of the, you go to the end of the prophets, that's when you see the restoration of Israel, the restoration of their king, the kingdom. 9, 11. In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David. Okay, that's the house of David, right? The Davidic dynasty. I will wall up its breaches. I will raise up its ruins. I will rebuild it as in the days of old. So notice the linkage to the old days. There are days coming when he's going to rebuild it that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. When the, and he starts describing what the kingdom will be like. When the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes will overtake him who sows seeds. When the mountains will drip with sweet wine. And does this sound good? That's wonderful. It's the agricultural produce. There won't be anything like lacking on the shelf due to COVID or something. 
Um, that it will be abundance, more than you need, ever needed. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards. They will drink their wine. They will make gardens. They will eat fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. That's it. If he said it, it is it. So a restoration of the kingdom. I've got lots of other passages. We won't look at them. Okay? But that kingdom in the Old Testament that was promised to David okay, in his house went out of existence and was no longer on the planet in 587 B.C. And a new time in history began, which is called the times of the Gentiles by Jesus in Luke 21. Okay? It's what I just call Gentile kingdoms because they have at this time been given political supremacy. God has given them the right to rule. We live in this time period okay, of Gentile kingdoms. God gave them the right to rule. So the book of Daniel, turn back to the left, Daniel 2 discusses four Gentile kingdoms. It's a metal statue, remember? The statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the dream? Head of gold, silver, and, you know, uh, breast and arms of silver, you know, waist and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron mixed with clay, right? Four kingdoms, which we're living after, so it's hindsight, and hindsight's 2020. You've got these four kingdoms. Babylon, he's the head of gold. Medo-Persia is the silver kingdom. Greece is the kingdom of bronze. And Rome, Rome is interesting in the book of Daniel because it depicts the kingdom as iron on the legs, but then the feet are iron mixed with clay. So it's got a, one section just iron, another section iron mixed with clay. We would not have known this at the time, but this actually turns out to be two phases of Rome. Okay, an ancient phase, the iron only phase, and then a future phase, which is iron mixed with clay. Okay, so these are all depicted. It's also depicted in Daniel 7 by the four monsters or you know, creatures um, and so forth. But these are prophecies that depict in uh, symbolic form uh, the times of the Gentiles, when Gentile kings, kingdoms would rule. Uh, the important point I want to make is that when did, which of these kingdoms did Jesus come in? He came in the ancient phase. I mean, what kingdom are we reading uh, when we read the Gospels? Who's ruling? Well, Rome, okay? Ancient Rome. Jesus came during this phase, and he and John the Baptist and the Twelve are going to do what with the kingdom? They're going to offer it. They're going to offer it to the nation Israel. And we'll look at it in a minute. Remember John, Jesus, they both say to the nation, repent for what is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. Do you see that the kingdom is a giant idea in Scripture? We saw it all the way from Genesis. Now we're, in the, we're going to be in the Gospels. Now, Israel's going to reject that ki the king, Jesus, and, of course, the kingdom, therefore. But in the future, there's going to be a future stage of Rome among the nations when the kingdom will be offered again, and on that occasion, Israel will receive it. I always say Israel gets it right the second time. Um, I noticed this, this really clicked with one of my sons. Because every time um, you, you, know, you start bringing up a story like, say, Joseph. The story of Joseph. Joseph is in Egypt. He's second only to Pharaoh. His brothers come to him. You know, they need grain, right? Do they recognize Joseph the first time? No. The second time they come, do they recognize him? Yes. She, Israel always recognizes the one God has raised up for them to deliver them only the second time. Moses, again, this is the whole story of Moses. The first time Moses strikes down the Egyptian, do they recognize Moses as their deliverer from the Egyptians? No. He goes away for 40 years. He comes back. Second time, here's Moses. Do they recognize him as their deliverer that God raised up? Yes. Okay. What do you think? This is a pattern that's been laid down in Scripture that Israel always... Uh, never recognizes their deliverer the first time, but they always recognize him the second time. So they did not recognize Jesus as their king the first time, but they are going to recognize him the second time. Okay, interesting. So the, this means essentially that there's no kingdom right now, but let's just see. Let's go to the Gospels. Okay. 
And then now you're going to get plugged in pretty soon to what is going on in history and why you are who you are and where you are and why you are. <clears throat> John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, he's, he's preaching the kingdom. Okay. There's no kingdom there. He's, he's saying, hey, it's, it's at hand, it's near, you know, but it's not here. But if you'll repent, it'll come here. It says, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4, verse 17. Okay. I, you could say this is John's sidekick. Okay. Jesus, what's he preaching in, in Matthew 4, 17? Is that anything different than what John was preaching? No, it's exactly the same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, people get confused. In between this, there's an event. It's called the baptism of Jesus. Okay? And people don't know why Jesus got baptized, even though Jesus said it was for all righteousness. Uh, they still don't know. Okay? If you get baptized, it means you're identifying. Jesus got baptized by who? John the Baptist. Who was he identifying with? John the Baptist. He's saying... John and I are together, okay? John's message is my message. He is the prophet that precedes the king, and the prophet always did in the Old Testament. Samuel preceded Saul and said, Saul's the king. Samuel, uh, Nathan, uh, Samuel preceded David and said, David's the king. Prophet always precedes the king. They're on the same page, and that's why Jesus got baptized by John. To identify with John and to say, we have the same message, and this is the truth, okay? So, the nation needs to repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word engido means near. It wasn't here. It was near. If I'm near to your house, am I at your house? No, I'm just near. Uh, some people say, no, it means here. It doesn't mean here. Lexically, it doesn't. It means near. Okay? Close. But something has to happen for the kingdom to come here, and that is they, the nation Israel needed to repent. That's right there in the text. It's very, very clear. Now, what is Jesus doing <laughs> when he, you know, you start the book of Matthew and it's a genealogy and by verse 17, you're all asleep. Why is that there? Because he is the son of David and that's the dynasty that is to rule forever. And so this is proving that he is in the line of David and has the right to rule as king forever. Now, what's interesting about that genealogy, beyond just the genealogy itself and the four women that are mentioned in it, which is super, all super interesting, is that these records for his descent from David were accessible in the first century. You could go down to the temple and you could research and find out if Jesus actually was a descendant of David. Now, they might, if you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee, that's the first thing you're going to do to try to say that Jesus is not the Messiah. It's just like, well, he's not even a descendant of David. Did you ever read that argument by the Pharisees and Sadducees in the Gospels? No. And you know why you never read it? Because they knew he was a descendant of David, because they went down and they checked the temple records. So that is there to show that he has the credentials of the king. The second thing you see in the book of Matthew that's a huge thing, and everybody talks about it, is the Sermon on the Mount, right? What is Jesus doing there? He's saying, I have the words of the king. That is, I teach theological orthodoxy. What does the law teach? He's teaching us what the law teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said in your synagogue, but I say to you this. In other words, what the Pharisees are teaching in the synagogue is baloney. This is what the law means. I am orthodox in theology. Does the Messiah or king have to be orthodox in theology? Absolutely. He's proving he is the king, just as his genealogy proves he's the king. And then he starts doing these amazing things. Whether you have faith or not, it doesn't matter. He starts doing miracles. He casts demons out of people, right? He heals people who are blind. He gives them sight. He makes those who are lame leap like the deer. Question. Why is he doing those things? Ask yourself, what will the kingdom be like in the future? And you will get your answer. Will the kingdom have demons in it? No. 
Will the kingdom have blind people in it? No. Will the kingdom have lame people in it? No. Therefore, will the kingdom have doctors in it? <laughs> well, they won't be needed. Okay. Because he's the doctor. Okay, He solved all their ills. See what is happening in the Gospels. Is he saying, I'm the king. I have the genealogy of the king. I have the words of the king. I have the works of the king. I can bring in the kingdom. If you'll just believe in me. But what did they do? Rejected the king. They said, we have no king but Caesar. That is a very explicit rejection. And therefore, the kingdom itself, as far as from a human viewpoint, it's postponed as terms of, in terms of its arrival. It didn't come at this time. And something happened. There's the introduction of this mystery age. That's where you and I live. Okay, this thing called the church, which is called by Paul a mystery. Okay? Christ is crucified, he's raised, right? He ascends to heaven, he's exalted, and you have the procession. That is the sending forth of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to begin to build this new thing in the mystery age called the church. Right? The church, which is a a word that just means like an assembly, a gathering. Um, we use the word church, okay? But it just means a gathering, okay? It's going to be Jews and Gentiles, okay? Now, who's the cornerstone of this new building that is being constructed by metaphor? Christ is the cornerstone. This is all Ephesians 2, right? Ephesians 2. Christ is the cornerstone. The apostles and prophets are the foundation so you would always lay the cornerstone first, right? If you were building an ancient structure, like Parthenon or whatever. You get that cornerstone level and right because everything else depends on it. So once, it, and he, Christ is it, so he's perfect, right? There's no problem. Then the apostles and prophets are laid as the rest of the foundation. Then upon the top of that, you have all believers, Jew and Gentile, right? That make up the building on top of that foundation. So it's all a metaphor, the building of this church. The church is not the kingdom, Okay. I mean, we, we read about the kingdom in the Old Testament. It was on earth. It had a Davidic ruler. Okay? We don't have that. Okay? Um, the church is not the kingdom. Okay? But the prophets did predict that it would be restored. We read some prophecies of its restoration. Okay? But that doesn't mean we're not related to the kingdom because we are. This is where everything that your life is about comes into play. Like, Why am I here? First of all, we are a kingdom positionally. Colossians 1. Look at Colossians 1. We are a kingdom positionally. By position, I just mean by like legal right. Uh, we are a kingdom, that, but we're not experiencing it yet because we're not in it yet. We're not in the kingdom yet. It's still future. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then you'll come to Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 13. The moment a person believes, they are transferred into this future kingdom positionally. Okay? It says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness, okay, past tense, and he transferred us, past tense, to the kingdom of his beloved son. Okay, so this is a kingdom that's coming, but our position is no longer in the kingdom of darkness. We've been rescued from that. And now our position is over in the kingdom of his beloved son. Okay, so we're kingdom, uh, we are a kingdom positionally. We are heirs of the kingdom. Let's see if I can find one close. Galatians 5, 21. So turn back to the left, go a few books, Galatians 5, 21. Okay, in other words, where, what is your future going to look like? Well, it's going to be in the kingdom, okay? Galatians 5, 21. It's going to be the same kingdom of old, but it's obviously going to be better because it won't just be like Saul or David ruling it. As good as David was, it's going to be the Messiah. Galatians 5, uh, 21. Uh, he's talking about the deeds of the flesh, and he says, envying, drunkenness, carousing, things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, you are an heir of the kingdom of God, so you shouldn't live by the flesh, because the deeds of the flesh are not fitting for the kingdom of God. So you, <laughs> you live like a kingdom citizen, a kingdom heir, okay? Don't live like uh, an unbeliever. Uh, we're also suffering for the kingdom. 2 Thessalonians 1.5. You say, why am I suffering in this? Why do I have to go through this? Why well, part of the reason is, is for the kingdom. Um, turn to Matthew 6. 
I like this one because um, it tells us one thing we can pray for. This is um, not really, you know, he's not telling us what to pray so much in this prayer other than really how to pray. But um, there's nothing wrong with praying, verse 9 and 10. Uh, pray then in this way, the manner, manner of prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, Where do we want God's will to be done? On earth. Now let me ask you a question. Is it happening right now? No, we live in the times of the Gentiles when Gentiles have been given the kingdom to rule the world. Satan has yet to be cast out. So, but we are therefore, according to verse 10, we can be prayer warriors for the kingdom, praying that it will come, right? We are citizens, Romans 5, 9, and 10, and uh, future, here we go, here, here it is. You are a future ruler in the kingdom to come. You are going to rule in the future kingdom. Romans 5, 9 through 10. Um, well, maybe this isn't the verse I wanted to put out here. Oh, I'm sorry. It's supposed to be Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Excuse me. Just dawned on me. Thank you for that hint, Lord. I don't mean he talked to me. I just mean <laughs> it came back to me what we worked through here together. Revelation 5, 9 and 10 as they talk about the Lamb who is worthy to take the scroll and break its seals to cleanse the earth of all evil and restore it to man, it says, Worthy are you to take the book to break its seals, for you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests or and priests, that's positional, to our God, and they will, future tense, reign upon the earth. What are you going to do? You're going to reign. So what are you in doing now in your Christian life? You are in training for reigning. That's why you're here. To learn how to be an excellent ruler. Do you think that all the fruit of the Spirit, for example, are good qualities of a ruler? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control... What do we want, for example, in a president? Would we be opposed to any of those things in our president? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are all the qualities of an excellent king. Those are also, of course, the fruit of the Spirit. We can't produce them in our flesh. We're to walk by the Spirit, and then the deeds of the Spirit become evident in our lives. These are qualities that are to come out of us now. Why? Because in the future, we're going to reign as kings in a resurrection body, and those will be the characteristics of our reigning. Okay? This is, as you say, that's going to be me? Yeah, one day in your resurrection, you're going to have that fruit all the time, continually. So, um, this is where history is going. The purpose is to reconform you to the image of Christ, Okay. Throughout this life, as you learn to live by faith, and the Spirit produces this fruit in your life, and one day you'll be resurrected, you will be just like Christ, you will see Him as He is. So He's going to be the King in this coming kingdom, and you're going to reign with Him in His kingdom. Okay. Now, do you know why you're here at least, in this world? Okay. Now, a lot of other things relate to that, I know, like who you marry, okay, what job you do. All, these things all relate, but these are just spheres in which you're learning how to rule, where you're in training for reigning. Okay? So, um, I would do more, but I kind of run out of time. But here's, the, here's the, the goal of history is to reclaim the earth by, by man, a man, which we would say is the last Adam, Jesus Christ. He's going to fulfill the original mandate given to Adam, and he's going to serve in the kingdom as a responsible steward. He will reclaim it from Satan. He'll defeat him. The usurpers in the book of Revelation are removed. Okay. 
Those who have believed in him will have the image of God restored in them to rule with him. And the basis of it all is the person and work of Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's the one that brings about the change. So the way for you to enter into the kingdom and to reign is very simple. Believe in Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the coming king. He is the son of David. He is the son of Abraham. He is the one. Okay. And then your position of rule in that kingdom is determined on how basic you, basically you live the Christian life and you persevere to the end and those types of things. Okay? But every one of us, I think, is going to rule. Okay? That was God's purpose for man, and it will be fulfilled, and you are a part of it. Okay, um, Let's pray, and then those who are serving communion, if you come forward, we'll share in this as we remember what Christ has done ultimately to restore man's rule, the finished work on the cross. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the so great salvation we have in Christ and that you have this grand plan of history as we back away and look at everything from your point of view and what you are doing and why we are here. Help us to plug into that now that we know exactly what is going on so we can be in training now for reigning in the future kingdom. And uh, we thank you that you have this great purpose and plan in mind that it's not all just marbles. But uh, everything is tied together and knitted together in a perfect plan. And it all reaches back to the very beginning, why you made us in your image to begin with. And uh, may we remember in this time the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the centerpiece of it all. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. See, I've got five guys coming up to serve. And if I don't have five guys, maybe another guy can come up here. Yeah, yeah, Caleb, you're up. Yeah, you're supposed to be up here, Caleb. One, two, three, four, five. Are you supposed to be up here? I love you, but you, know, <laughs> you can come up here. But I think he, I think he's on the list. If you are, I, I don't want to get anything wrong. Thank you. Okay. In the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you. As the Lord Jesus Christ said, you have prepared for me a body. And we thank you that you prepared it perfectly by a virgin conception and a virgin birth so that there was no sin. And then he was tempted in all things as we, and yet again without sin, so that he qualified and that he paid the sin penalty for the whole world. We give you thanks that he paid the penalty for our sin and that by your grace we have come to faith in him as our Savior and that we thereby have everlasting life. We give you all praise and thanksgiving for this. In Jesus' name, amen. saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ, who knew no sin and who had no cause of death residing within him, gave his life of his own volition. He said, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He could have taken himself off that cross, but he decided to keep himself on it to pay the sin penalty of the whole world so that we could have a relationship with you. For Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And we thank you that we have come through him, the one who is God and man, the one who has died and the one who lives again and lives forevermore. In his name, we give thanks. And in his name, we pray these things. 
It's all in perspective, doesn't it? Let's go ahead and stand and sing our last song. able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen, amen.